So my name is Amit Lohia. Hello. Yes, I'm Uli. Hi. Um, and we are representing a startup called Bloodlink. Bloodlink is an Indo-Danish startup. We are we founded we were founded in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. We are still based there, but we are also working in India now, which we'll tell more about. Um, Bloodlink is basically connecting blood banks, hospitals, and blood donors with the sole purpose of making blood collection as easy as possible and making a blood sufficient world. So how many of you has ever donated blood? Quick, fantastic. And how many of you have encountered a situation where you got a message on your WhatsApp or Twitter that somebody is in need of blood and then you went and donated blood? I see few hands. So in India and in most part of low income countries in the world, there is this practice of replacement donation, where if somebody is in need of blood, the hospital or blood bank will give the blood they need, but then they expect the family or friends to replace the blood. Has anybody experienced that here? Exactly. Blood is a fundamental component. Even though it is 0.001% of the cost of a big surgery, but it's the most vital component. We feel that access to blood should be democratized. Everybody should have access to blood without any hassle. And with Bloodlink, we embarked on a journey to figure just that out. So in 2002, my father went through a kidney transplant operation for which he needed few units of blood. I was based in Mumbai, living in Mumbai back then. The hospital gave him the blood he needed. His surgery was done. But as soon as he came out of the operation theater, uh, one of the persons from the hospital came up to me and said, Amit, we gave your father four units of blood. Could you get donors to replace the blood he used? It's like, yeah, I could do that, but right now I want to be next to him. You know? But they said, no. Could you do it now? Now, they explained that there is a shortage of blood. I'm not sure till date if that's the case. But in my head, I was in a conundrum. On one hand, I wanted to go to and sit next to him and see if everything is okay. But on the other hand, there was this pressure that I need to find blood donors. So I, I contacted uh, some of my friends just to complete that story and my cousins and then I, I was lucky to live in Mumbai so some of them showed up. One of them had alcohol the night before, he couldn't donate, then I had to call again. So there was this frantic journey of finding those donors just to reimburse the blood the hospital needs. I have received other messages and these are, this is what I was talking about in WhatsApp and Twitter where somebody is in need of a specific type of blood, platelets, plasma, so on and so forth, and they broadcast this. Well, in our belief, this shouldn't be the case. There should always be blood available wherever we live. Timely availability of blood is very important, especially in situations like epidemics, dengue, which we all know, which uh, surges up during the monsoon, or if there's a terrorist attack, natural disaster, or even if somebody has a rare blood type which in India is, is the Bombay blood group and it's prevalent you know, in the central parts of India. So this is a global issue. Currently, World Health Organization estimates that there is a global annual shortage of about 10 million units of blood. On top of that, 10 to 15% of all collected blood is wasted due to limited shelf life of blood. Blood expires in, 32, in uh, um, 35 days and certain components like platelets, they even expire in five days. I talked about replacement donation. It is a practice which we believe should, be, uh, should, should not exist anymore, which is the case in most developed countries where if you need blood, you go to hospital, you get it, and there's always blood available. The pressure is not on you to find blood. So the thing part, this is what happened last year when um, early, early 2016, when uh, I wanted to donate blood in Denmark. And I was told because I couldn't speak or read, uh, I'd recently moved to Denmark, I couldn't read the legal guidelines to donate blood, that Amit, you cannot donate blood here. I was like, I usually donate blood after my dad's experience, but this is weird. And of course, they have their legal reasons where you, know, you, you need to understand why you're donating and, and so on and so forth. It's the case in Nordics. But then I made a little research, figured out that Denmark is blood sufficient. Small country, five million people, pretty homogeneous, not that big an issue. But what about India? I went, my head back, went back in 2002, and then I started using Google for, for things like finding out what's the scale of problem in India. And that led me to a point where I figured out it's not only a problem in India, where there's three million units blood shortage, 
there's a rampant wastage, but the shortage in wastage is fueling a thriving black market of blood. Maybe some of you are aware of it, or if you call, if you say a red market. And this is not in India. It's the case in most low-income countries, and even in parts of Eastern Europe, which, uh, you know, which are supposedly more developed, but the problem is rampant. So then, what do we do? I decided to embark on a journey of blood link, and how do I go about this, tackling this sensitive issue? So the first thing I did is build a team, an international team, you know, people with, a uh, team with different disciplines, you know, we, from marketing and communication, to design, to even um, social business, or social ent entrepreneurship was picking up, it's still picking up, and we are still working on a very social enterprise model. Impact is profound for us, but that's, that's not the topic of discussion for today. Bloodling was conceived, uh, we have come far, and uh, we put a team together, we started talking to different people, but we realized that it's such a sensitive topic. Uh, and we decided to do it in India, just because we knew the problem was, was profound here, and we could make an impact. We did a lot of research, speaking to regular donors, NGOs, blood banks, and we figured out that there is sensitivities like, I'm afraid of blood, I'm afraid of color red, but I'm a vegetarian, I don't want blood from non-vegetarian. So how do you digitize a solution for this this is how we began uh, designing our service. And we have come far. Uh, service design or human-centric design, I didn't know anything about, because I personally come from a very tech background. I'm an electronics engineer. But then, it, when I heard about it in Denmark, um, I figured out this is the way to go forward. Because in order to answer all those social idiosyncrasies and mindsets, which science has already proved is irrelevant, we need to design a service which people can connect to. Otherwise, we are not going to make any difference. We didn't want to go towards an approach of making a tech platform um, just because it wouldn't make that impact. So this is where Bloodlink's journey became even more interesting. We put our faith in service design and human-centric design, and we decided to listen to our customers or stakeholders. Um, yeah, I, that's where I kind of came on board at least uh, some time ago. And I think if I had to pick the word that is most important as a designer or a like human-centered designer, it is to listen, especially if you work in a startup. It's easy to get carried away by the tech solution that somebody came up with or your, your own first solution as a designer. And it's extremely hard to keep that listening up. So I think the listen part is, is, is the one word I would pick if I had to describe um, search design. Because you constantly have to tweak your you have to tweak your solution and stay open to new ideas instead of sticking to your first idea. So this is just a, a short, uh, so this is the loop uh, that Chris mentioned earlier. It's, uh, you know, like you, you build something, you test it, and you learn from it. Then you analyze it, you build again, you talk to people again, you learn from it, you build again, and so on and so on. So this is those are just some impressions from, from our India trip. So we spent one year going back and forth between Denmark and India. And because there was always a flight involved, uh, you, you become really uh, aware of um, whether it's worth going or not. Uh, as, as opposed to, you know, just stepping out your door and researching with people next door. And that I think that's a takeaway, not like in an Indian context, but that I will take away from my work uh, for the rest of my life is because I had to go to India and it was really hard work here in India, um, I realized how, how valuable it is to have users nearby that you're designing for. I mean, it's kind of like a common knowledge, but you should always value access to your users. Because for us, it was a big step to get that kind of access. So, getting out of the office, how you want to call it, um, is of course about understanding the context. This is kind of one of the standard examples, I guess. Um, if people are using books, manual bookkeeping to write down blood donations, how are you going to digitize that easily? If they don't have internet, how are you going to use your smartphone app? How are you going to sell your smartphone app to the um, technician who is actually taking the donations? So I think that's, that's the logical part that everybody knows about service design, that you, you learn about the context. Um, but as I said, because it was such a long journey, we became even more aware of how important that is. Um, another thing is, uh, as opposed to, let's say, talking to a random user in Europe or Germany, where I'm from, you can be pretty direct. And if it's a casual user, you can ask them questions. 
if it's a doctor in a complicated environment, that's complicated. If uh, it's a doctor in India in a complicated environment, that's even more complicated. So just the value of face-to-face -face, a conversation with a doctor is so much more than s just sending an email. You cannot just send a survey to people, like nobody answers that. I mean, even in Europe, nobody answers that. But you know, at least you can get information online, being this kind of half stranger from someone in Germany. A doctor in a, in a hospital in, in a blood transfusion office is busy, has political things going on. They don't want to share all this kind of information that might be okay to share, but they just don't want to take any risks. So it's important to build a trust information and be on the ground, especially in the medical field and the social field. And of course, you can build short iterations. Our iterations when we were in Denmark were like a month or so. Our stakeholders would get back to us after weeks and weeks of nagging them. When we were here, we just walk into the office, show them the prototype, and we would get instant feedback. So a lot of these things seem obvious. But again, uh, just if you are designing for users next to your house, then do that. Um, it's just a reminder, I guess. So all these iterations brought us all the way from the first solution that was blood bank to blood bank, very business oriented. And we figured out there are just too many hurdles and it's not going to work, at least for now. Um, but how can we make the same impact with the same solution over many iterations? We ended up with uh, a chatbot for donors. And I know chatbots are super 2015 or something. Um, but it's something we want to try, right? So uh, I'll tell you a bit more about it later, but it's a pilot that we're running now. And it actually makes a lot of sense based on our research. Although at first I was super skeptical when Amit brought up the idea. I was like, nah, that's like... Anyway, but we did our research on that one. So the basic things we're trying to solve is to um, educate users. So being a vegetarian does not stop you from donating blood. But it's a, you know, there's no, there are no stupid questions. People need an easy way to, to get their questions answered. Maybe chatbot is one way to do it. Um, for now, we, we think it might be, it looks, it looks good, but we're still testing on that. Um, second one is convenience, right? Um, you want to have the convenience to donate blood easily. Our chatbot can uh, assist you and do this very basic assistance of finding a blood bank near you, which is also like, like I, I didn't even know where blood banks were back where I live. I had no idea where to go. So it's also about awareness a lot, right? And then eventually, uh, it's a bit fuzzy, but eventually you should also be able to rate the procedure and give feedback so that the whole system goes back into the hand of the donors. The donors are the ones giving their blood. And sometimes they're not treated the way they should be treated. That's why there is no voluntary donation. That's why people have to be forced to their family members to donate blood. At least that's one of the reasons. So it's important that donors feel that they are in control and maybe uh, rating a blood bank and giving feedback to the system, which is currently a black box, um, is one way to do it. So just some quick learnings here as well. If we could start over, or I mean we're constantly starting over, but something we're doing now is we want to start even smaller. We limited ourselves to Mumbai. Right now we're still limited to Mumbai, but we wanted to get like a bigger group of people and so on. If you can, start with the smallest town you can. Start with one friend trying to send money to this friend or giving blood to another friend, if whatever you're designing. Do the one-to-one -one first. Um, that could solve a lot of issues. And in the end, we spend a lot of time talking, talking to a lot of stakeholders that we could have spent on designing for like a one-to-one -one interaction, which we still have to do now. It's like, but we just waste a lot of time trying to balance a lot of different opinions. What you should do, but you know, just be aware that uh, for the products and designing cycle, sometimes smaller might be better. Um, we should have worked a lot more with communities. I mean, we did work with communities, but in a social and health context, um, communities are the ones that are the multipliers. For almost every social cause, there is a community out there that can help you, give you feedback. We talked to a handful, but we should have talked to even more of them. Um, especially in India, people are very aware of problems and people that are in those communities, they're very eager to help. And I was surprised how enthusiastic they are. Um, maybe again from my cynical Berlin background, uh, people are like, 
you know, they're hard to, uh, to be enthusiastic sometimes, especially students in Germany. I feel like here we talk to mostly college students, they're the most enthusiastic people um, I've met. So we should have done more of that. And something we've been doing, but it's, uh, it's an ongoing struggle, is to um, consider your impact. I think that also goes back to the keynote we saw today. Don't design for the obvious solution and keep the impact in mind. So this would be your, your kind of standard, standard journey, which would probably be loop as well. You have a design process, you have some kind of usefulness that you can validate, um, and then that hopefully translates into money or some kind of uh, products, product strategy that informs your, your, your next product and your strategy. Um, what's missing here, what we had to do a lot, is we didn't just want to build a startup and sell it, we wanted to have a social impact. So we had to spend a lot more time on the left side of this, talking more to stakeholders, acquiring more do domain knowledge. I knew nothing about blood donation. Um, and get a knowledge of the ecosystem so we could avoid um, unwanted impact. So we could avoid um, undesired impacts and foster the desired impacts. And sometimes that money thing there, that would be easy. You can, it's easy to please a blood bank if you build something for them or easy to, to um, appeal to someone in the, in, the, in the system, let's say, the existing status quo. But if you're a social uh, enterprise, you, you want to change something, right? So you cannot just build something for them to operate smoother, which the, the upper part might lead you to that kind of solution. You have to make sure that you, you balance your impacts, right? So building something for a certain stakeholder might not have the desired impact. Um, so I don't know who has tried the uh, latest Facebook find a blood donor feature. Anyone? So Facebook recently released a feature where you can find donors around you and where organizations can find donors. Um, and to be honest, I didn't spend enough time on this yet to make a proper judgment, but um, I'm gonna make one anyway. Um, or at least uh, ask a question, right? And what they're doing is they're connecting donors to patients or people in need. Isn't, doesn't that sound familiar? That's, that's exactly what Amit's problem was in the first place. Like, yeah, he, he's the one in need, and he had to message people on Facebook or WhatsApp to find a donor. Now Facebook is building a feature that just makes the broken system run smoother, like replacement donation <coughs> times 10, right? So I hope this is not the case with what they're rolling out, and I'm sure they can change, but that it re immediately struck us as this kind of, as this kind of direct approach that might, always not be the, might not always be the best solution. So um, if you want to help us with the pilot, um, hit us up on Facebook Messenger. That's currently the only platform that uh, supports our chatbot. Um, it's an early prototype, so any feedback is appreciated. We also look for UX designers who want to work with us in the long run, uh, people on the ground to shorten that, that iteration cycle, right? Yeah? Uh, just quick note, so if you want to know more, just feel free to reach out, we'll be here. For, for the rest of the day. A um, lot of you might have seen startup, you know, lean startup and design, and it can be orthogonal, you know, as processes, but we have tried to bring them together. So just one key learning as a founder I want to share is that we have been, it has been really useful for us to use service design or human-centric design to uh, refine and validate our value proposition. So anybody who's from the startup world, they know the business model canvas, it has really helped in that, in that, you know, making very sure that the value proposition is concrete and how do we valid that, validate that uh, with real customers. It's taken us a long time, but now we, we see our learning loop is shorter. So try our chatbot. I mean, if it's still in a prototyping phase. It's still, um, you know, we are working on a prototype in nine blood banks in Mumbai. The pilot runs till the 14th of November. Give us any feedback if you have. Give us any ideas um, and check us out at bloodlink.life. Let's make every drop count. Thank you. Woo.